to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to a well-designed business. It's Power Talk Friday. Today, we're going to switch gears a little and talk about art because I specifically know that this can be a revenue stream for your interior design business, and maybe you have been avoiding it. Well, my guest today, Judy Brower Fancher of Brower Miller and Cole Art Consulting is here to give us a little education and wait till you hear how she talks about the difference between real art and color Xeroxes. Trust me, you're going to want to know this. Judy has her certification in interior design. While she's not practicing interior designer by profession, she understands the complexity of the role that you have and the impact that you make on your clients. Judy sources art for both residential and commercial spaces, and she has spent two decades traveling the globe to understand art, architecture, fashion, and design from various parts of our world. Judy's mission is to create that final layer on a space with art and believes that a highly personalized final layer to a home or a workplace can embrace more than one background and help tell a story, a compelling story, to those who visit the space. Before we meet Judy, I'd like to thank the sponsors of Luann Live, which is happening this November 5th through 8th, 2023. Our sponsors include the Profit Insiders Academy with Nancy Ganskaufer, The Confidential with Tracy Connell, Duke Renders, My Doma Studio, and the Interior Design Society. Each of these outstanding organizations are committed to helping you run a more profitable business, and we will put links to each of their websites in the show notes. I also highly encourage you to go to luannlive.com to learn about the speakers and the lineup that we have for an action-packed several days in Orlando, Florida. All right, let me introduce you to Judy. Hey, Judy, thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Thank you. After hearing a thousand episodes, it's pretty much fun to be talking on one. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I have to say it's, it's, I love talking to anybody and I would talk to the doorknob. We all know that, but I love talking to people who also listen to the show. It just feels like two old friends getting together, right? Yep. I hope I do a good job because I usually learn something on each podcast and I'm hoping I'll learn something today from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hoping the opposite and I'm pretty sure I'm going to learn something from you today. So we're talking about art. And we're talking about the importance of art in interior design projects. And I thought that that you said something in your intake form to me, Judy, that I didn't understand what it meant. And I thought maybe it was a good place to start. And you just you mentioned the difference between Xerox art and real art. Now, someone that's not a designer and is not, you know, an aficionado of any of this decor world... That was like, well, do I know the difference between Xerox art and regular art? Like, I have no idea. So tell us, what what is that? What does that mean, Judy? Well, um, what happens is that people that are searching for art sometimes find things online. Let's say that's a pretty easy example. And they buy it and put it up. Now, when you're in high school and you have a poster next to your bed, it's pretty cool, or your first apartment. But in an interior design situation where the clients have some money, it's a shame if the people have art that's not the right quality to go with their home. And a color Xerox is literally a jacle is a term that they use. It's that is using a inkjet printer to make a copy of something. So it's literally a color copy of something um, in which 
some cases the original piece wasn't even very good it's a blob of colors or it's um a bird with some gold glitter on it or something that wouldn't nobody would really buy it as real art probably so a, a copy of it's even more sad and it, <laughs> I don't know if you're allowed to tell the truth on air, Luann, but have you ever... Oh, no, we only talk truth here. <laughs> have you, have you no ever matter walked... how much it hurts. <laughs> have you ever walked into a house, let's say you and your husband are at someone's home for dinner for the first time, and they have some amount of money, and you walk in, and as you've said on the show before, that they always run out of money before they get to the window treatments. Right. And you guys come into their house, and they don't know. They think their house is great. And you're like squeezing hands or something or trying not to laugh because the window coverings look like they bought them at Walmart. Right, right, right. We've I've, That's actually happened. We're like, you know, the drapes don't even hit the floor. What are we doing here, folks? Right? Yeah. yeah. So that's what and it's so you're like. saying. Okay. And so the thing is, though, like, I think I, you know, I, th- okay. So if I am at a bargain store, what I, we're not, we're not using any names here. We, we did agree, <laughs> <Judy and> <laughs> I agreed that we are not going to use any names on the high or the low end of this situation. But if I'm at a bargain store, I, I know when I buy something for $20 or $120, I know that that might appeal to me and that might be appropriate for, you know, my powder bathroom and it's cute, but I know I'm not buying art. Are you saying that I could be a homeowner without any education like myself in the finer things in life and I could spend six, seven, eight, nine hundred, two thousand dollars on something that's truly not art also? Is that the level of um, the sophistication that this printing process has reached? Um, yes, on the printing process and yes, on we always say we're family here, I hope on the show, on the <laughs> markup that might come with it. Um, okay. Once you have okay. a piece and it's framed, if it if it costs the interior firm X and they're charging Y, and it's a three hundred dollar piece of art, it, are they really charging sixty bucks, twenty percent markup, or is it going somewhere else? Um, mm-hmm. And as a homeowner, yes, absolutely, they can go into a um, one of the mall stores. Some of the there are real art galleries and some shopping centers, but the uh, right. some of the mall stores would be a good example where the, nothing in there is anything but a color Xerox and it's all framed and you Whoa. get one for 400 bucks. Okay. But I also can go into one of those quote unquote mall gallery stores and find something for two or $3,000. So is that what the ones that are actually starting to carry art or that also is not real art? Um, often there'll be one or the other. There are not many galleries where you're going to find the color Xeroxes and the real art, but there can be okay. very inexpensive original art, which is just somebody that hasn't been discovered. Mm. And that, and that and is a good thing, right? Can, that is, that you're lucky, absolutely. right? Absolutely. You can find something for $500 that's gorgeous, especially if you love it. Art should be emotional. Mm. That's the main key is that the person, um, I did a blog post saying that um, acquiring art should be as passionate as your first kiss. <laughs> you should want to look at it and think about it and tell your friends and you should really oh, be that excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So, so I'm, I, I guess what it is, is it's a little bit of buyer beware too. It sounds like get, and especially, you know, it's one thing if we're just garden variety humans running around in the world and buying art for our own living rooms. But when we are trusted professionals and we are, you know, supplying and educating and sourcing art for our clients, we probably need to have a little bit of education on it and know what we're doing. It seems to me no different than if I were going to, just because a sofa might be $4,000 doesn't mean it was made of good quality. And so just because I expect an inexpensive sofa to be a thousand and I expect an expensive and quality made custom sofa to maybe be 20,000, I can't assume that the 4,000 one is well made. I have to know what goes into a well made sofa. Is that make, does that seem like a right analogy? That, there? That's definitely part of it. That's definitely mm-hmm. is that people don't always understand what they're buying and what they're getting. Right. So I right. think I think that's correct. And also, um, I'm going to just go back to that. It really is something that should speak to you. Mm-hmm. And it's not a judgy thing. When I was saying about biting your lips, if you walk in and see the terrible window treatments, um, it, not everybody's going to like the same pieces of art. And that, right. and so it's not that um, I, 
I don't think I approach this from a highbrow situation in that way. But if you're doing a client's home and it's a $10 million home, I think the trusted professional should know not to offer them a color Xerox for their wall. That's, that's I think that's the nudge there, right? So if you, us personally find something that speaks to us, we don't care if we spend twenty dollars or twenty thousand dollars. But when we are the trusted professional, that's the thing. So we're in a ten, fifteen, twenty million dollar home. We I just like to my to your point. I just the my point in this conversation is the education of the professional designer out there so that you know it's if if it's a, you don't know you don't know type thing right and so okay okay so the thing about it is is i know that you also said something particular to me that i thought made great sense um when we were talking before air which was that again i think we're also talking about the luxury project. Let's, uh-huh. let's just go there. We are talking about the luxury, luxury project. So you said to me that the budget for art, your recommendation, it is not in the budget for design. And I liked that thinking there. Talk to us about that. Um, the budget for art should be a completely separate topic because you don't, it, this is not something that comes out of your design budget. Um, art's really different. It's not a depreciating asset, and I'm sorry to use that word because I'm not really talking about the people that are buying, selling multi-million dollar art pieces, and they call it an asset class and everything. Just in a normal home, the art goes with the person. If they change homes, it goes with them. It's um, it's a separate thing. And over the years, even the most amazing lay range is going to get old and yucky and not be worth something, whereas art from the 16th century still looks good. So mm-hmm. it's really a separate thought as um, the art. And if these people are multimillionaires, they probably have an art consultant and you can just ask them that. Do you guys already have, you know, I see that you have, that your home seems to have beautiful pieces. And I think even the novice can tell the difference. I'm going to say that yeah. too, without really an education that you can walk into some people's homes and say, my God, they have beautiful art. Right. Um so, well, so you know what I think about that is, you know what I, I have to tell you, <laughs> I think that when you see the real thing, even if you're a novice, I think you, you can discern it. And that doesn't mean you cannot be fooled, but I think you can discern it. But the other side of it is I always say about the home goods thing, like I love the designers, you know, their radar for finding the gem within the junk. So like if I walk into home goods and I'm looking for an accessory for my powder bath because I'm not going to do a fancy room. It's just not me. It's not what I value. Right. I, I love all of you guys for doing it and I want you to make the world pretty. Um, but the thing about it is, is I can be, unless I am to your point, just this, I love, I love this. I have to have it. I don't care if it's $3 or $45 and it's on the shelf at home goods. I have to have it. It speaks to me. But if it's just something like, oh, that would probably be a pretty accessory piece there. If I turn it over and it's like four bucks, I'm like, oh, it's probably cheap (laughs) because I can't see that, you know, whereas I have this one designer here in New Jersey and I always used to tell the story how we would play where's Waldo in her finished rooms because she was truly a high low designer and Mm -hmm. she truly would shop for fine accessories, but she'd fill the room out with home goods. And when you put that lower price item in the right environment, I can't tell. I I literally can't tell. So if you had a beautiful room, unless the art really looked like it came from, you know, 1-800-art.com, I don't know that I would know. You know what I'm saying? I would be, oh, it must be amazing. So that's why I think the education piece is important. As If I were the one Like I, I, you know, sell custom window treatments. I know what fabric is good. I know what drapery rods are good. You can tell me I don't want to spend this much on a drapery rod, but I'm not going to also tell you it's a quality rod, right? So Uh we can do what you want, but you are coming to me for that information. And so that I think is on the onus of the designer to know the difference, right? Yes. And um, definitely... Uh, no house should be, well, our house kind of is filled with art in, a, ridic- filled in with a ridiculous art. manner. Um, but, <laughs> you know, as you're, as a designer is designing a home, you're not going to want to put gorgeous original art in it. You want mirrors. You want decor. Mm. You want textiles. It, like the walls shouldn't just be stuffed with 
art pieces. Right, like a museum, right? But in certain areas where you know you want real art, and that, as you're saying, they, it's like if you're paying attention, it's not flipping it over and seeing it's $4. Really, you would, it matters where you shop. Mm-hmm. That really yes. is going to be your best bet. If you go into an art gallery that's a real gallery, they're not going to sell you some piece of junk. Right, right. You know? They're a trusted resource for it. So yeah. so the other thing is, so just before I start to ask you, how do you know and where do you go, um, I want to go back to the budget conversation. So I love the idea. Now, I, I don't think you're suggesting that when you start a relationship with a client that you don't bring up a, a budget number for art, but you're just saying you educate that it's not your advice, that it's part of the design budget because the sofa is eventually going to wear out. And if you, even if you move out of the house in five years, if you're at the luxury level, it's chances are you're not going to take it or you're going to, you know, repurpose it or whatever, because, but art is different. It is something that it is part of you and your family. Again, to the point that when you're, helping a client find art, you're also helping them find the art that talks to them too. So they're probably likely going to want it for the rest of their life. Yeah. It's, it's not really um, picked to match the wallpaper. It really, (laughs) you don't want your house to look crazy at the end. And the framing has a lot to do with that, but you know, making things cohesive with the design or the aesthetic, but, um, but yes, you want to pick something that is, it's part of them and they love it. And so that's, it's just separate from their home design. It really is. And so I think a designer could feel comfortable in saying we're going to, you know, get you the budget for that. Also, have you thought about the art component? As I'm saying, depending on how high end they are, they might already have somebody. And then that's that's great. And maybe you ask if you can talk to that person so that you can make sure that the aesthetic comes out well. Um, Mm -hmm. But otherwise, that you would like to present them with an art budget that they should consider as well, because that can be part of the final layer of their home. Mm -hmm. Because... The truth is, if you don't separate it out, you know, a, a piece of art that speaks personally to somebody could be a 20, 30, 40, 50 grand piece. And there goes the budget for the room in half or in a third. And that's silly that like we still need the rugs and the sofas and the lamps and all the things. So um, and that is what's going to happen with art. It's going to just hit you between the eyes typically. Right. It it can. And I mm-hmm. think in a general way, if we're I mean, we're kind of trying to talk luxury high end, but um if you think of one to two percent of the price of the home, that would mm, probably that's a good be, way to know it. So, like, if you have a million dollar home that you're spending ten or twenty thousand dollars on a few good pieces, if you have a ten million dollar home, then you're spending a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand on the art, and that's separate. It's, as I'm keep saying, but I do want to make yes. clear that this is not something that should take away from your profit. It's something that should add to it because. Mm-hmm. Um, at least the way that I'm working on these things is that um, I would have the interior design firm acquire the art. And depending on how they work with their clients, if they have the um, open, like, hi, we charge 20% on everything we procure, and you get an additional art budget and you charge the markup on it, then you're making more money. It shouldn't come out of your budget. It should be additive. Right, 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 right. Like you, you're, what you're saying is they should be making money on the art purchase as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Okay. And I love the other thing is when you are working with that super luxury high end consumer, it's do you already have an art consultant? Because that's probably entirely possible. And if not, then you could say, I, I've got someone that I recommend that I've worked with before and that could be yourself or whatever. If somebody has a, somebody at a gallery, right? Yeah. Okay. So now, I think that one of the reasons that makes sense to me to be educated on this and to make it part of the conversation, especially when I'm working with the high-end luxury consumer, is because if I'm not going to bring it up as the interior designer, how is this person going to know how to incorporate this into their projects. And it's sort of like if I'm going to design, and we're talking about the type of luxury consumer that might have a three, four, five hundred thousand dollar kitchen, right? And so in my mind, I'm equating it to that. If I'm de- designing a home, you know, seven, eight, ten million dollar home, of course they're going to have art. Come on, they're, they're definitely going to have art, right? And so to me, if I don't bring it up, 
it's no different than if I'm knowing I'm working with a luxury consumer that's going to have a $500,000 kitchen and I don't say, what kind of stove are we going to put in here? It's like, oh, somebody else will figure that out. It's like, no. So it feels like it's part of the responsibility of the designer to take that elephant and put it in the middle of the room and saying, I know you're going to get art you, or you have art. We got to work this into this situation, right? It, it should be part of the conversation, but it's just not always. Um, I, was, I know. I can imagine that it's not. I had right? a friend that said, did you see this thing on next door? You know, the next door app, this lady who moved into a house and I can promise you her home was at least 10 million, if not 15 or 20, because the community she said she lived in, that's just the prices there. She said, I just finished um, getting my home designed and now I need art. Does anybody have any ideas on where I should find some? <laughs> I mean, she literally said she'd had an interior designer do her house. And now, yeah, they, so that designer the left that blank. money on the table, that money le- that she left that, that he or she walked away and left that money on the table. And also the opportunity to help them find beautiful pieces and frame them so that to your point that they are cohesive to the space. Any- right. So. Yeah, uh, I'll give yeah. a little VIP tip on this, depending on how early you can get them to talk about uh, whether they want you to find art for them and stuff. You can do things like put in floor lighting to uplight the art pieces. You know, if you know they're mm. going to get a really special piece, it should be part of your interiors to highlight that, um, to be thinking about how you're doing your reflective plans for the lighting, because mm. you want to use, well, I recommend <laughs> um, to use flexible lighting that you can turn because they might change pieces over time and they don't want to tear their house out. Right. Um, you don't want to have to tear up your ceiling again if you don't have to. So if the um, interiors people would give them some lighting that's a little bit. Uh, move, with those with, like goosenecks or something on so it? that it right. can be moved to go with the art piece. But as I'm saying, the up lighting is, can be really gorgeous. If you know that you're putting something in to put in some floor So that's two really good points, right? So when we are doing that initial design consultation and we're selling the initial project, we are also, there's going to be budgetary things that are going to happen in the design budget that are going to impact what's happening over in the art budget. And so that's good to know, especially if you are going to make investments in quality expensive art yes we want to have the lighting on it the right way not like i can never see it really good because you know whatever this the hi-hats aren't working or something yeah okay all right and then you had mentioned to me that there were a couple of other at least three other tangible benefits um from an interior designer's business standpoint not just the credibility of your expert professionalism and that you're really curating an entire space for somebody but that are good reasons for them to think about educating themselves and adding actual real art to their projects. Yes. Um, the, the art is noticeable. So at the end of the project, when you're doing your social and taking your photography, it's going to be a lot prettier if you have really good art in there that helps complete the picture. As I keep saying, the final layer that you want to have it look good. If you're going to style it with some, uh, I don't know, bowl of lemons on the countertop in the kitchen, (laughs) then you don't want to have some junky piece of art behind it. Um, So that's, that's part of it. Um, Also in the magazines, like an AD, and I think everybody likes to be published in the higher end magazines, the art really adds to the luxury feel of it. And if you look through that magazine, you will see that they either in the caption or in the story itself will mention Oh, and they have the art by so and so, or the and it, maybe it's no one I ever heard of either, but I assume it's somebody fa- fabulous because they're mentioning it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, so right. it, it's not that it's a Rembrandt or something, but that um, that that's part of showing the good taste of the home is that it includes that in it, so it makes the fun for your social and everything. And as long as I know on TV they blur it out um, because of copyright, but on your mm. on your social and on your other stuff, as long as you mention the artist then you're fine. Okay. You're not selling the art. You're, you're not copying it. You, you're taking a picture of it in it's um, in situ. It's just there. And, um, and you just mentioned the name of the artist in there or on the photo caption art by so-and-so. 
So that's a good point to realize. I, I don't think, I mean, I know that photographers have to be mentioned because they took the photo, but I wouldn't have thought about that. So if I do do work for a, a, a project and I do do a beautiful room and we take a picture of it and the art is real art and it's prominently displayed and it's seen, we've got to say who that art is, that, that artist is. Yeah. Otherwise that's not kosher. It could be okay. very, very little, but it needs to be there to protect that. Just because, I mean, to protect yourself, you don't want someone coming back and being like, you should showed my art it's like sure we bought the art too but the copyright still goes to the artist isn't that interesting i would have thought that once you buy it it's yours and you do what you want but i hear you it's a whole crazy world (laughs) these rules we're we're just being careful we just want to have everything be happy um another thing that's kind of a good idea and this is funny but if it's not your superpower to pick art there's there's i'm sure there are car mechanics that know art there are certainly interior designers who know art but it's aside from the point because it's not part of the curriculum in the interior design Mm -hmm. um I'm guessing that there's a lot of people that be like, oh, Cindy, it's time to get the art for this project. And they hear their person, their employee. Oh, my God, no, I'm busy. I don't want to. <laughs> and the thing is, you're paying for their time. It's costing you to have them search for the art that, that they hate looking for, that is disruptive of the work that they're really good at, what, what their real superpowers are. And you've distracted them into something that makes them unhappy and the client may be less happy with it because they don't get what they were hoping for. Um, so right. it's it's also a probably a, a nice um, morale booster <laughs> in certain <laughs> designers' lives to not have to worry about that. Right. And so that's where they can partner with somebody like yourself, where you can come in yes. and work with them and you understand the project and you have a probably a whole intake process. And then the, you go around and source and make suggestions for the spaces and for the um, different um, art for the project. Right. right? Yeah. And I think the okay. designers often know a lot of the input already. Because they mm-hmm. have, um, according to what I've learned on your show, <laughs> they, <laughs> they've they've taken the time to learn about the client and their personalities and their likes and dislikes and where do they like to vacation and all the other stuff like that that goes into the aesthetic for their home. That that's the same kind of thing that will go into their aesthetic for the art. So right, it's not right. terribly thing, different. Same hot buttons that are going to mean something. You know, the possibility of hitting on a piece of a piece of art as a suggestion to them that's meaningful to them. Correct. And I yeah, I, love it. It'll make them happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was another thing that you mentioned to me, that the project generally can have a higher success feeling, a, a success factor, because the overall satisfaction of the consumer feels better because an emotional piece of art that was placed in a beautiful room that the designer took hours to source every single thing, but the art that sits there at the centerpiece of it is the emotional connection. The sofa isn't necessarily, the sofa sofa could be a $30,000 sofa. It could be the exact same, you know, fabric. That's the only one that would look good in the room and the quality and everything else. But when you wrote that in the intake form, that actually client satisfaction with the end process with the end product i should say is is raised because of the emotional attachment to that art that makes sense to me yeah when they walk into their home at the end of a long day and they look at a a painting or a sculpture i'm just gonna throw in sculpture too when you're thinking about yes layouts um that when they walk in and see something and they're like and it just it it just makes the room look finished and perfect yeah. and and yes their heart maybe goes to that piece but I'll tell you what if I could have a $30,000 custom sofa that some of your listeners <laughs> designed I bet I would <laughs> swoon for that too <laughs> uh, but you know what it is you know what is there's this um phenomenon and it has a name and you know maybe somebody knows the name and they'll put it in the Facebook group or something but there's some phenomenon where you know you really really want something you really 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 want it and it's like it's like when you've first when you were going to get an iPhone or whatever. And it was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then you get it. You're like, this is my new iPhone. This is so cool. This is great. And then like a day later, you're like, yeah, I'm just making calls on this. (laughs) Like, it's like, you know, there's something that happens when we go and we buy aspirational things that within X amount of hours or days, it comes back to being a utility thing again. But you know, I don't think art is like that. Like the sofa could be like that, but I don't think art is, right? I think um, when you get the right piece, you 
to go back to that thing that you just want to look at it with love. Um, yeah. There's actually a study that when people look at good art, their blood uh, increases. And it's the same area of your brain as when you look at a person you love, when mm-hmm. you look at art that you love. So over the years, you can love it more. I mean, yeah. I get I get really attached. I like figurative art, like with people in it. Yeah. I like hanging out with people. <laughs> and I, I feel like um, we move art around in our house and I'm like, where's my friend? If it's not <laughs> in the room anymore. Um, so I actually... Uh, I think that's a, it's a, well, it's a scientifically proven thing that, yeah. um, that people, when they love art, it literally makes them feel elated. Yes. And yeah. So, yes. And that's what I'm saying. It doesn't seem to have that shiny object syndrome of going away because you create an emotional attachment to the art. Whereas the sofa, you might've convinced yourself or your partner, how important it was. It was going to be the show stopping piece and all that thing. But I think the sofa falls into that utilitarian, like, and now I have a beautiful sofa and it's prettier than all my friend's sofa and all the things, but I sit on it and I have my <laughs> coffee on it, you know? <laughs> yeah. You don't notice it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty crazy. So I love that, that, you know, intangible client satisfaction raises when you are able to place meaningful quality art into the projects. And then you're the one that gave them the art. And when they are ready to buy a second home or to move, you are more tied to them also because they, I mean, they're going to probably take, if they move, they'll take their art with them. If they're buying a second home, they might take a few of the pieces and move it into their new home and replace the ones through you with the, their mm-hmm. existing, you know, if they are multiple homeowners, that they keep buying art through you over time. Um, because they associate you with the, the person that they do this with. And it gives you another Which touch begs point. the question. Right. Which begs the question. Where do we know to go to get good art that we're, you know, actually, you know, how do I mean, that's if you've mentioned the car mechanic. That almost feels like if I don't really know a lot about art. How do I know the place I'm at is good or how do I find a network or build a network of, of resources? I know that we can hire someone like yourself, uh-huh. a consultant, and just rely on you. But if what, maybe I live in a very cosmopolitan area, how do I vet where to do, you know, to source art? Um, visiting art galleries is a good way to do it. And I know that for some reason, and I'm, that's all I can say is for some reason, people are afraid of art galleries that they, mm. they're worried about walking in if they don't know art, if they don't feel... Um, whatever, that they're afraid the art person will be snobby to them. Mm -hmm. Um, Just like a shoe store, an art gallery is a business. Um, Mm. If you walk in, and I I don't know that your listeners must know with vendors, there must be something similar with fabric companies, with whatever kind of companies. If you come in and they're snotty to you, you should like smile and kind of back back out and go find a different one because okay. <laughs> they're, they're businesses and they should it be nice. Be they should be happy that you're there looking. And um, the, the gallerist should explain to you, this is the kind of art we carry. This is the um, money range. If that's what you're wondering about, you know, cause you'll know what your client's budget is vaguely. Um, and here's, they'll, they can share with you about the artist, about the piece itself, et cetera, et cetera, that you can then share with your clients to help them understand what this piece is about and give them that education too. So they can even appreciate it more, not just, mm. not just how it stares, although that's important, um, right. but the meaning behind it and everything. Um, in addition to galleries, the gallerists will have different, uh, each gallery kind of has a point of view. So you would want to my suggestion is so that your homes don't all look alike. You want to keep make, making everything fresh to not really make friends with one gallery and only ever use them. You would want to have several galleries because there's going to be a lot of different, bigger choices of artists. Um, but also the outdoor art shows, and I'm not talking about necessarily the giant art fairs, not Art Basel or whatever, which is, you know, galleries that are in the art fairs. But at regular outdoor art shows that most neighborhoods have in the summer, especially, which we're coming up to here, um, those are the artists themselves standing in the boots. And okay. the price will be lower because galleries charge about 50% more. That's generally the rule. So that I think as soon as a, an artist is represented, their price goes up. Okay. So if you find these artists at the art shows, it can be beautiful quality original art and it's going to be a little lower priced and then they can tell you all about their art and as long as right. you as long as you like it they're going to love you because they're they're emotionally invested in their pieces that's how they create 
And so it's super flattering. It's like having somebody come in and love your design and be like, oh my God, I love your designs. It's like, well, I love you too. What a coincidence. You know? <laughs> um, but um, so that's good. There's um, some artists have their own studios and that you can, you can just do like a local Google search to find out where's, where's the studios, which art shows are coming up near me, which art galleries are around. If you don't already know that you can see what the, different galleries are and kind of get a feel online and then go visit with them um and there are online sites that sell real Mm. art they um represent galleries um which i know is you know during covid everybody became an online everything so um but there um there is real art available online from the the galleries are represented however it's a little like searching for dining table on google Mm. (laughs) you're going to have hundreds of thousands of responses so that's a little tougher you probably want to narrow it down by having a better idea of in person what's around you that you can see and get a feel for and then maybe they suggest an artist to you and you can look that artist up if you want and find other pieces or whatever the gallery will Mm. help you find other pieces but um but there are there are lots of nice and it should be a fun experience that's you know certainly if you enjoy it you don't have to know anything when you start you you learn right Right. By, look, yeah, no, by talking 100%. to people and looking like, if I ever had to do window treatments, I would listen to anything you said. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> you know? And the, right? the galleries and the artists are experts at their own work. So you can yeah. just listen and to them. The and advice. Look. Yeah. And I love the advice. If the, if the gallerist or the employee at the gallery doesn't, isn't welcoming, isn't willing to share the stories, isn't willing to teach, then don't assume that that is the status quo for the industry, that it, that's an archaic way of doing things and you should move on. Okay. Now you talked about, you know, the, 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 the actual art fairs where you're meeting the actual artists and their stuff is sitting right there next to them. Obviously, um, to your point, the price point is going to be lower. So, um, the thing is, in that situation, we're really connecting with what makes sense to us because we know it's real art. The person right there did it. Like it isn't <laughs> off of a Xerox, right? So then it's a, it's becomes like irrelevant if it's $500 or $10,000 because we were looking at it. We love it. We love the artist. We love the story. But what should we, if we're just stepping into this for the first time and maybe our client, you know, has budget, has investment money for this, but they are also first time art buyers and they're saying, well, we've previously gone to Walmart, but we're happy to be educated. Like I heard you say the one to 2% of a higher end client, they're probably expecting that, but by piece and what, what, is there any rule of thumb or is it just like it's art taught? Like if it talks to you and your client likes it and it fits, then it doesn't matter if it's 500 or 5,000. I would say it doesn't matter if it's 500 or 5,000, as long as it's real art that was by an artist that you, and you like it or the client likes it. Um, mm-hmm. That really is the point. There is such a thing though. Um, my sister got a hundred cards when she was married, you know, the cards with the gifts. Yeah. And I'm sorry. Marla that I said my sister um (laughs) she doesn't know art particularly um and she got this one card and she put it in a frame she was like it's so beautiful and she put it in a frame in her bathroom so I'm over visiting and I go in and I'm like oh you have the um climped kiss she's like what it's a famous piece of art there is art that resonates with everybody and that's kind of a lot of times the art that's more expensive it, mm. There is such thing as art that people love yes, in general. Yes, it's lovable, basically. Yes. Lovable is what you're saying. <laughs> and and you can kind of tell at an art show too, honestly, um, there's going to be booths where you, they're more popular. Mm. And that's, it's because their art's more generally universally appealing. It doesn't mean you can't go to the one guy that no one's paying attention to and find that piece like you do at Home Goods. Mm-hmm. You can find mm-hmm. something incredible that you love, but, um, but it's kind of, you know, when you're at these, the art shows are different quality as well. <laughs> right, right, right. So, right. you know, well, some of it. them, everything yeah. costs a little more, they're higher end, and these are the more successful artists. And it's because their work is, people love their work. Mm. They haven't mm-hmm. been okay. necessarily become famous, been picked up by a gallery, but it's clear that they are, they're, um, they've traveled to get to the art show because they know they're going to sell because people love their art. 
Okay. Okay. You know? All right. And even at the end of the day, it still has to speak to you, right? Or you has to, you know, if you're out there scouring for your client, you're taking pictures, you're taking it back to them, or maybe you're, you know, shopping with them there or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And so that's what okay. you can definitely find things that are amazing at any price point. Um, art is actually appraised by the square inch, which is really yeah. annoying to me. <laughs> But so larger pieces cost more, even by the same okay. artist. They cost way more when you want a large one than if you want a smaller one. Okay. Um, and uh, so that's just something to be aware of is that when you are looking at the big spaces, it's probably going to be more in the thousands and less in the hundreds because of the size that you might need. Right. Um, so it's just okay. keeping in your thoughts. And this is like the weirdest question that really has not anything to do with the way a designer does their business, but it just hit me. So there is a, a like, you could take a piece of art that you've had and then sell it back to, su- to somebody, not to the artist necessarily, but there's like a resale art market, right? Like, there is, like, cause, yeah or no? There is a huge resale art market, but it's really at the higher end. Um, okay, we so have it's a, not your average card, right? We have a piece that we bought for five hundred dollars that now costs twenty five hundred. I mean, it, but we've had it for twenty years, and mm-hmm. art generally goes up in value. It just does as long as the artist is doing well. They keep raising and raising their prices. It's like having mm-hmm. a home designed by some of your star interiors people. Right. When they started, it was probably cheaper for to get their work. Right, they were a hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> now they're eight hundred dollars an hour. Right. Yeah, but um. I think people, for their homes, they should be buying art that they want to own. That's why. To keep. To yeah. keep. Um, but if it's at the higher end, if you're buying something that's buying a, a, a pretty famous art or an emerging artist, yes, that you can definitely sell it for a giant profit later. Mm. Um, but, well, I'm saying definitely. It's a risk because the art market is flexible. Right, but, right, right. Um, but if, yeah. you know, if you bought what Andy Warhol, I guess, at the beginning, he was just partying in his loft and people got art for five bucks from them or something if they held on to it you know it's great yeah yeah I think I was more thinking about if I were if the designer was working with a client and they're going from one home to another and they have a big bigger size piece of art that maybe they loved and maybe they're just middle of the road on it and maybe it's not that forever piece for them they thought it was um and and or maybe they're downsizing from a you know 10,000 square foot home to a 3,000 square foot townhouse or something and where do they do with the art if it doesn't work, if it doesn't fit anymore? So, you know, and I wondered if that market would be a market that somebody else that is now the one getting the 10,000 square foot home, there's a, you know, I guess a resale market is, I guess that's eBay probably. I guess or um, first dibs. Oh, first dibs. First dibs has art on it. So you can certainly try and sell art that way as well. Um, And also buy it and source it there probably then it sounds like, right? Yeah. I think. um, Okay. That's a, that's a very valid way to do things. And like I'm saying, it, it probably would be worth more. You could probably actually make money by selling it if you've held it for some amount of time. Um, mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I was more of the motivation. I'm not talking about the investor who's intending for it to go up and trying to find that emerging artist and, tra- you know, tracking all of the information to know who's the next big it guy or girl, right? It's more like it just doesn't fit anymore. Or maybe my ex picked it out and I got it in the settlement, but I don't really want it. I just got it because I didn't want them to have it. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that definitely happens. And that's where <laughs> I know. Um, one of my clients actually has some art that is not fancy that she's getting rid of. And I'm going to get her some new things, help her find th- new things. Um, and she was asking about it. And I did just think up uh, there are charities that do housing mm. and things like that. And you can donate your art. And take, oh. take it off on your taxes or the clients. Can, oh. They can donate their art and take it off on taxes either to a charity auction, you know, like maybe their church is having an auction or Yes, right, like a that. tricky tray at the school or something. I mean, something better than a tricky tray. But there's, you know, the American Cancer Society, when they have their, you know, what do they call those things? When you do the bids and you buy a certain amount of tickets, like those are nice gifts there. Sometimes it's like, you know, trip for two to Bali, you know what I'm saying? So a beautiful piece of art that you don't have any use for anymore could be something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A little tangent there. Oh, man, that's okay. <laughs> well, silent auctions for charity are good money for the charities. Yes, that's the thing. It's, right. a, it's a very wonderful, valid thing to do. And you know, the art's going to a good home because whoever buys it loves it and they're going to take care yeah. of it. So you're not yeah. throwing it in the trash or something. 
Love it. Love it. Love it. So did we leave anything out in this conversation, Judy, about art and what designers should know? How about a little bit about working with someone like yourself that is a resource for interior designers, a consultant? How does that relationship work a little bit? Well, I can be as visible to the client as they would, as the, as the interior designer chooses, that they can either do the entire contact and I can never meet them and they cannot know I exist and I will take the input from the interior design firm do the sourcing, bring them back choices if more than once if necessary, of course, you know, um, or I can just take the process off their hands completely because I am used mm. to talking to the clients and take the input and bring them choices and, and just keep the interior design firm up to date on what's happening. I would want to know the aesthetic for the home if they have renderings mm. and things and the, and the sizes and what they're picturing, because I think the designers do have ideas about where they think art should go and what would make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but it should be an easy process like that. And, um, I would like to say that your designers should not be scared of art or the art world. It's, it's, I, I bow down to, I don't know why, um, people don't understand. Um, before I did a little studying on it, I didn't understand about material rubs and about the backings on the window treatments and about the lumens in the room where you have to figure out that, I mean, it's such a hard field and these people are so smart. Yes, um, they should not be intimidated by anything and certainly not by art, which should be a joy. <laughs> yeah, that's such a great sentiment, Judy. I appreciate that because it's true. Um, all of the things that an interior designer has to understand, take into consideration, be prepared to explain and justify and talk about, um, it's, it's mind boggling, actually. And something like art to like to your point, to avoid it because it feels unknowable doesn't make sense when they rack up all the things that they've somehow got knowable on. <laughs> <laughs> and to your point, they can, you know, outsource that entire process to you and either have you be involved in the face with the consumer or behind the scenes is it's, you know, it reminds me like, again, we keep using the customer sofa as an example, but most of the time, the 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 artisan the workmanship the the one that's doing the workmanship of actually building the sofa is 90% of the time not interfacing with that consumer at all the designer is going to the workroom and saying okay what kind of frame and how what kind of support and what kind of fill and how are we going to finish this off and then they bring the information back and the designer, think about it. The designer doesn't feel funny about that. They don't feel like, oh, I'm just a conduit for information. I don't really own this. And where do I get off, you know, explaining the value of a $20,000 sofa and why I think it should be in room? It makes sense to a designer that that's what they do. And I think that's what you're saying here is it's the same thing. You can go with somebody like yourself and let them be the whole thing in the back. And then you show up and here's the offering as the designer. This is my suggestion, this piece for this space. Right. Yes. And I, yeah. I'd always suggest that you show them a couple. It's, okay. It's still art. <laughs> so. okay. That's it. That's a good point. You know, it's funny because I actually made a conscious decision to say this piece for this space because I mistakenly thought, I, I just thought the rabbit hole, like, oh my God, like, it's like, no, it's not that one. It's this one. It's like, let me show you 20. It's like, and I really thought we come to it and say, this is the one based on everything. But you do think that, do give the consumer a, a choice or a couple of choices. Yeah. I just showed 14 choices for three pieces um, because it's art. And she's it's like, personal. I love some of these. Well, she only needs to love some of them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I hear what you. So she had three different spaces. So she was going to end up with three choices, and you showed fourteen to get three wins. Interesting. That's good to know. I like that. Yeah. Well, and you know, it does make sense. Honestly, like, you know, it is ultimately the art has to hit you in the gut. I think if you're going to spend any kind of coins on art, it's because it hits you in the gut, not because you think there should be art there, <laughs> right? Then, yeah. then we get to the joy again, to them coming yeah, home yeah, and yeah. smiling at their house. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, did I uh, leave anything out that we should bring up in this conversation, Judy? I feel like I explored my curiosity um, on it. I'm going to throw in one thing. If any of the people listening 
realize that they might have color Xeroxes in their own homes. This could be a fun way to start. I know a lot of designers like practice on their own houses for things. Um, Mm. Run to a gallery this weekend and see if there's something you like better. Interesting. (laughs) A little or, challenge for you, right? <laughs> and they can, yeah, or just start to explore the the process of getting comfortable with it. Yeah, and I think I do think that they start with their own homes quite often. So this is a wonderful way to do it, where they can be like, "Oh my God, it does make me happy to come home to this." And yes, there are choices that I like, and no, it's not that expensive if I don't want it to be, and or it can't right. be expensive. Doesn't always it depends on be. where you are in your right. financial life, but right, yeah, right. But that's also a good point. There's entry level everything. There's entry-level art, just like there's entry-level sofas and entry-level ovens and all the things. And you can, you know, find the best value that speaks to you for what your current budget is and then aspire as you, you know, grow in your development of it. So that's a very good point. I like that. Oh my goodness, Judy. Well, this was very helpful, very informative. I love ways to help interior designers put more dollar bills in their pockets so that they can keep doing the amazing things that they do and making all of our homes and our lives better and more beautiful. So thank you for helping us with that today, Judy. Thank you. It was a pleasure, Luann. All right. So It didn't sound too difficult, right? I mean, it might still be a little intimidating. That's not lost on me. Um, And this is one of the reasons why when the opportunity comes, I do keep doing the interviews on this topic because I do think it is a revenue source that is sometimes overlooked. And previous episodes when we've talked about this were with Liz Beeman Delman, Leslie Price, and Catherine Earnhardt. And we'll put the episode notes, um, the show episode in all of the show notes, okay? Each of these ladies came to join us and talk about demystifying fine art purchases and talk about empowering you to bring it into your projects. And now Judy is taking it a step further and talking to us about recognizing real art rather than settling for a Xerox copy of art. And if you aren't an art guru or aficionado, maybe you don't know the difference, right? And that's okay because... Now you know the difference. Now you know at least enough to go figure out, right? That's what education is all about. And once you are educated in the world of art, you can confidently make it part of the conversation. Think about it. If you're doing a $10 million home, a trusted professional like yourself, you shouldn't be offering a color Xerox as their piece of art right? Judy shared with us tangible and fun ways to learn about real art and artists. One way is simply to visit art galleries. The gallerists are there to talk about the pieces and educate you about the pieces and the artists who created them. Another thing that Judy suggested was to visit an outdoor art show. There are dozens of booths set up and the actual artist is sitting right there just dying to tell you all about their story. And we're talking about the luxury project here. And again, on Liz's episode, we learned that art shouldn't compete with the project budget. Okay, this is another thing that Judy said as well, that the budget for art should be separate from the design budget. And this is because the art is personal to the client and it goes with them when they move. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Think about the benefit that this has for you. The overall satisfaction of your client and the project is much higher when they have an emotional connection to an art piece that they know is of great quality. They love it and it feels special to them. And the other tangible benefit of sourcing art for your clients is that apart from your home design, the final layer of having art there really up levels those photos that you're going to take, right? How often when you look in the magazines, it's the money shot includes a beautiful piece of art. Okay. So these are really good reasons to think about adding and understanding first, educating yourself, uh, and then understanding how to do this. I love that there are 
are consultants like Judy that you can work with and that they, you know, will do it however works for you. You can consult with them and the client never has to see this consultant, Judy, or whoever you use, or you can let Judy or another consultant come in and run the art process. No different than you would have, you know, a GC come and stand there and talk to them all about how the beams are going to move. Like you might decide that you want to move a wall, but he or she is going to explain how the house is going to be supported when the wall's gone. So you do you on this, all right? Um, Judy is confident in that the relationship between the designer and the art consultant should be easy, okay? So um, make sure that that's something that you expect if you do reach out to somebody and you want to collaborate, all right? Start to explore, Plan a day, run out to an art gallery, stroll around an art festival, and talk to some of the artists. You can even mix this in with a self-care day like we learned recently from Katie McDonald in episode 881. She encourages you to do self-care days. She encourages you to put some fun in your life. And this could be a way to do that. All right. Luckily, Judy has a download for you. It is a helpful tip sheet on how to make more money on where you can find art. To get it, email Judy at jbrower, B-R-O-W-E-R, at browermillercole.com. The link will also be in the show notes. All right. Thank you tons, Judy, for reminding us about the importance of art and how it can up-level interior design businesses and up-level the happiness of the clients that we have. Thanks tons for joining me. I appreciate you so much. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.